was going through life, sis. I said, I can't. I didn't go through any life. I did. Trying to I keep know, up with you. Was, you. That was on it. What's up? We're up. <laughs> Good day, everyone. This is WJZZ Cool TV. I hope you're listening to us and watching us today. Of course, as you know, you have a number of options. We stream live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter. And anything else that you can think of that's a, that, that, that's a new uh, service, trust me, we're on it. I'm attorney Linda Bernard, and welcome today to Chop It Up with Linda Bernard. Uh, my guest today is a very distinguished man and actually native Detroiter by the name of Paul Henry Johnson. He was a, he is, pardon me, a retired Detroit police officer. We're going to talk about um, the police department. We're going to talk about retirement uh, for the grown and sexy and the young and sexy and a number and any other issue that may come up. But one of the things that I do want to focus on today uh, are the opportunities for people who retire out of one career and really want to do another. So and he's an expert at that. So that's what we're going to be focused on today. So listen carefully because your income potential is really unlimited. Uh, good day, uh, Paul. How are you today? Good morning, Ms. Bernard. How are you, uh, uh, Attorney Bernard, shall I say? Oh, that, that, that's shall fine. I, um, we, we, I said earlier that the, that the topic for this show really is um, options, professional options mm -hmm. for the grown and sexy, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I think you are. Well, thank um, you. you are a retired police officer, is that correct? That I am. Happily and, retired, may I add. I see. And you started with the police department like people do with the military when you were 18, is that correct? 19. Oh, 19 years old. 19. Okay. Uh -huh. And when did you retire? I retired June 22nd of 2011. I see. So you've been 8 retired. 8.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> So you've been retired for a number of years then now. Yes. Actually, yes. almost ten. Almost August um, of this year. I uh, shall I say shall, shall I say June of this year will be um, ten years. Yeah. So you took you can retire from the police department after what twenty five years or twenty. Well, we had a new uh, contract, so the formula was twenty five years, eighty five percent of your pay, or twenty years, sixty five percent of your pay, and I think I had a crystal ball I saw uh, in the future that things were going to change and when I say change uh, the tide of police and community was uh, it was it was starting to wane what does that mean back in the day when I say back in the day uh, when I came on in 1989 the old timers the officers that had been on the job 20 years then Yes. Um, they would share things with me. And I, when I say the old timers, black, white, Hispanic, it didn't matter. Uh, policing was a family uh, type of profession. After work, um, we would meet in the parking lot. Um, they would barbecue the, the original tailgating. We would barbecue. We would have libations. And we would just, it was family. We would, you know, talk about the day's events. Yeah. Fast forward, people would get off work. they go straight home. Nobody would talk to anyone. Now, not to say that every precinct was like that, but I just noticed from the older guys to the younger generation, they get off work and everybody doing their own thing. And so I just saw a change. And I says, well, no sense to me staying another five years. Let me get out at age 42 and start my second career. Uh, I love teaching. I love interacting with the youth. And I love traveling. So I just encompass all of them together. So you actually retired at 42 with at the 42. pension and everything? Pension and everything until the city filed for bankruptcy. And then, of course, um, our pension, of course, as you know, um, was cut and we lost health care benefits. So For retirees, but for I think retirees. they're getting them back now. Okay, and, and they may be, but, but and, and you have I, to survive, yeah. you know, without that. that that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. But you were young and healthy, so that was... And that helped. That helped. My dad used to tell me, "You can eat a donut, but just eat one a day. Don't don't eat the whole box." And so I <laughs> well, tried see, to I'm stick to that. Well, see, I'm in the whole box part. You know, <laughs> don't take me a Krispy Kreme. I mean, I'm on it six with no problem. Then I start to slow down a little bit. So, um, so you opted to become a retiree at 42. 
Yes. And you, as I understand it, you were a teacher for a while, but out of the country, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, yes. I, I found a teaching position in the beautiful country of Honduras. And talk about an experience. Not to say that I didn't enjoy teaching here in America, because I did. Um, I One week, I challenged myself, and I taught K through 12. I did elementary school, midweek I did middle school, and then the latter part of the week I did high school. And the most rewarding of that week was doing kindergarten class. I did five kindergarten classes comprised of 25 young people and talk about the energy that you have to keep all those kids focused and entertained and keep their keep their minds sharp. And at the end of each class, as I stood at the door, they all walked out and they hugged my leg. Oh, that was so sweet. And There's nothing like children, actually, nothing for, like in it. terms of uh, in terms of exactly. A so, how was it in Honduras? Now, you're mm -hmm. a police officer. You've been doing some teaching in mm -hmm. Detroit, and then you mm -hmm. go to Honduras. Yeah, like I said, I found a job uh, on on Craigslist, and I interviewed via. So, Zoom. I want everybody to listen mm -hmm. to that. Check out Craigslist for these opportunities. Oh yes, you're you're, you're not bound to Detroit. Your yes. feet are not in clay. Yes, you actually can can do other things, and you don't even speak Spanish or anything like I that. I don't, and that's not what they hired me for. They hired me to teach English as a second language. Okay. And I even asked them that. I said, you know, my Spanish is un poquito, which means very, very little. little. And they said, that's fine. The kids don't want you to speak Spanish. As a matter of fact, if the kids were caught speaking Spanish amongst themselves, once they entered the room, I was told to immediately check them. And they would, they would, come. but you know, kids are going to be kids, right? They want to say, oh, look at this new guy in their native tongue. Yeah, right. And so I could pick up on a few things, but I would just quickly say, hey, no speaking Spanish in class. And they, sorry, Mr. Johnson, we won't do it so again. So they were polite? Polite was not the word. I was almost taken aback when they came into the room. Every student would say, good morning, Mr. Johnson. And we're talking high school students. Really? Good morning, Mr. Johnson. I said, good morning. And and once they leave, have a good day, Mr. Johnson. And once again, not to say that the students here in America weren't cordial because my mom and dad used to say, the fruit doesn't fall far from the it tree. It never does. So you know the parents, or shall I say, you know the students whose parents have raised them the right way. Mm -hmm. And so they're very, very respectful. But it was just the attention that when, if I would, excuse myself from the classroom, go to the restroom and come back. You know, kids are going to be kids. They'd be laughing, talking amongst themselves. As soon as I entered the room, I didn't even have to say class attention. They immediately stopped what they were doing and were attentive. So it says something American parents need to, need to listen to, I think, carefully. Uh, when you teach your kids to be courteous and respect adults and especially respect their teachers yes. and follow directions, which is very hard, to do sometimes, yes. um, your child reaps the benefits, and the teacher can teach. She or he is not yes. disciplining yes. all the time. If you if you only have people 50, to the office, right? If you only have fifty five minutes, fifty minutes from the time the bell rings to the time that the next bell rings, you've got to get as much information, uh, you know, conveyed to the students, right? right. And then you got to have time for Q and A. The t the, some kids want to engage, and with that, the clock is ticking. Imagine if you spend five to ten minutes trying to get the class to come together. Right. You've lost ten minutes of that. So 50. were the kids on time in Honduras? They were in the class upon me walking into the classroom. If I was already in the classroom, they would come in. Mm -hmm. And when the bell rang, they were there. They were, there's no drama. No getting kids out of the hallway. I mean, kids, of course, you're going to have some kids to be kids, right? You, right. Uh, I don't know the percentage of a, of a classroom that you've always got that one who wants to attention. be the attention getter, right? And then you would just engage him or her. But uh, it was almost, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, when Tell our audience right when there. all mm -hmm. eyes are on you. Mm -hmm. All eyes are on you when you walk into the room and they're, they're ready. They're ready. So my lesson plan had to be prepared. Um, it, it, it's sort of like it's game time, it's show time. And they're, they're ready and they're like sponges. Mm -hmm. They they want to learn and they they will engage you. 
So yeah, it, it was it was I a but, pleasant experience. But, but then you came back to the United States right before COVID. Is that correct? Now I did. Now here's the irony of that. Okay, and and my dad and my mom would always say everything happens for a reason. So I put in my leave day request early. Mm-hmm. Okay. I wanted to uh, rendezvous with a cousin that lives in Texas. Now, Honduras and Belize, it's only a three-hour flight from the island or from South America to the tip of, to Texas. So I said, okay, I want to take that flight in February. Then I said, well, since I'm at it, why don't I also put in a leave request in uh, May, May 24th to be exact, because my one of my nephew's daughters, his youngest daughter was graduated from high school. And they said, well, that you're, you're requesting two separate days? I said, yeah, one in February and one in May. Well, they said, well, the country's dangerous and, 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 and we, we don't want you to get in trouble. I said, well, I, I know that. I knew it was dangerous when I went to the bank and there were two armed guards outside the bank. Now imagine this, two armed guards outside the bank with shotguns. When you walk in the bank, an additional three armed shot uh, armed guards in the bank. I said, "What what's going on here?" What type? I wouldn't be going to the bank. <laughs> well, but you have to go to the bank, right? You got to do your business transaction, but not just the bank. The grocery stores, the cell phone company, their gas stations are comprised of one gas pump and a shack with a person to get get your money. Armed shotgun officer there armed police everywhere so i i knew then that yeah this this is this is different but i but i felt safe i I would take walks after class i would walk down uh this dirt road to the main road and just just get the vibe of 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 the city yeah okay Uh, ladies and gentlemen you're listening to wjzz cool tv it's a real pleasure to have you with us today as our listening and watching audience Our guest is Mr. Paul Johnson, a retired DPD teacher who's going to teach us all about how to retire at 42 when you're just grown and sexy and keep it moving and keep making money, which is what he's doing. Um, I'm an attorney and your police commissioner for District 2 here in the city of Detroit. It's a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to bring you this broadcast. And I urge you once again to vote for Linda Bernard uh, in November of this year for police commissioner for District 2. Now, you mentioned what you were doing in Honduras, but mm-hmm. when you came back to the United States, you decided to relocate from Detroit to Las Vegas. Yes. The city, the real city of lights. How'd that happen? Well, true story. Um, 51 years of my life, I had never visited Las Vegas. And there, there, were, there were three reasons why. Um, having been married, uh, for 20 years now I'm divorced my wife my then wife we never we never visited Las Vegas my co-workers my buddies um, they would go um, they would take you you know yearly trips it might be Vegas it might be uh, Miami um, some of them did go internationally but um, to like the Dominican and things like that but I'm not a gambler Although I worked six years in the casino, uh, uh, the gaming unit at MGM specifically, I just gambling wasn't my thing. My dad never taught me how to play cards. My daughter's 21 in her third year in college. She she knows how to play spades and tunk and, you know, all the other games. I don't. I don't even know how to shoot dice. I do know how to play roulette. And to me, it's simple. You just take your chips and put them on the numbers and let the ball spin, right? But with that, never been to Vegas. So I said, well... It's September, it's about to get cold, and I don't want to see another winter. So what I decided to do was go on Craigslist, <laughs> <laughs> and I found uh, a um, what they call a um, an Airbnb, and a four month deal, um, around eighteen hundred bucks. Which you do the math, it came out to like four sixty eight a month, and. It just it just worked out. So you liked Vegas. I I loved Vegas until I got a call to go to Kuwait. <laughs> yeah, but you had decided really to leave and to live in, in Las Vegas. I, you're, I want... you're, you're grown and you did some other jobs while you were there as well. Yeah, yeah. But but once again, you were fully retired 
and yes. just decided supplementing to, my to, pension to do things mm -hmm. differently and, mm -hmm. and decided to work. Most people, many people, mm -hmm. will supplement uh, mm -hmm. their their pension mm -hmm. uh, with a separate income. Mm -hmm. uh, before you went to before we talk about Kuwait and okay. we advise our listening audience about about how to do this. Um, what was the, the was was there was it a big challenge for you to leave your daughter in Michigan and go to Honduras or not really move to Vegas or not no, really okay and and the reason why I say that is because um, when she left my daughter when she left for Hampton University which as you know is in Virginia it was it the hard part was for me for her to leave like I I'm I'm. My daughter and I, we're, we're, we're really close. I, I have this saying, we literally have 520 consecutive Saturdays together from birth to age 10. And at age 10, uh, one Saturday, she saw her girlfriends coming down the street and she let my hand go. And I knew then, you know, my daughter's growing up. And so, um, but we, all our Saturdays were together. The library, uh, going to the mall, you know, um, teaching her how to fish here in Palm Park. There's a little pond there. Yeah, there is. And she, it's funny. She caught a boot. The only thing she's ever caught was a boot. She caught, she reeled in a boot, and her cousin caught an actual fish because so, they put fish in the pond. So you you were comfortable with disconnecting from your Detroit family, so to speak. I, I was. I was. Okay, so then. Because my mom, my mom is deceased. She lived to be 94. Dad had, had passed, you know, um, 2001. And, and so and you, my immediate family wasn't Your there. Your sister lives in Atlanta. Sister lives in Savannah, you know, um, nieces and nephews live in the Atlanta area. And so, yeah, so it, it helped that I, I didn't have well. Someone to hold on well, to. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it just goes to show you when you're free as a bird, when you cut those ties, you know, when you're divorced, etc., you really can, using my expression, you can giddy up. And I really do believe in, in and, being and, able and, to giddy up. And, and his mm -hmm. point uh, to me right prior to the broadcast was that uh, he has two very important things on him at all times. What are those two things? My valid driver's license and my valid passport. Okay. And I'd say valid because you can have a driver's license or, and or a passport, and if they're not valid, you can't. I mean, you can drive, but if you get caught with an invalid driver's license, some police officers will lock you up for that. Not just write your ticket. Mate, it could lock you up. Yes, they can. And confiscate your vehicle. And, and home, confiscate your which vehicle. Which is the bad part. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you're, okay, so then you're in, in Vegas. But before leaving for mm -hmm. that, you had mm -hmm. started training and mm -hmm. working out to mm -hmm. to be yes. in Kuwait. Well, first of all, you, how'd you find out about Kuwait? And then what, okay. what did you have to do to get ready for that assignment? Okay, so the job in Kuwait, um, I went online. And didn't look on Craigslist. Uh, I looked on Indeed, Indeed.com. Okay. And as some people may or may not know, you can post your resume on Indeed.com, and the employers will find you. They'll That's seek true. you out. And so how the, the algorithm works, it'll show you all the jobs that um, you qualify for. Okay. Me being retired police officer, me, being, uh, me having... Um, training in executive protection uh, I was happy uh, and and blessed and honored to have been uh, on the executive protection team for um, Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick uh, during his early administration his first term and so I had uh, the necessary experience shall I say right and so a lot of companies um, look for that and um, and so yes yeah, so I, I I had what it took and I saw uh, the job uh, it was a force protection officer in Kuwait working specifically on an army base. And our job would be to um, check the IDs of the foreign nationalists that worked uh, on the army base. We would check for the IDs, make sure that they were authentic, authentic make sure that um, uh, the expiration date had not expired, and make sure the person holding the ID is actually the person because as you know some people will give their girlfriends or their or their boyfriends their id and say hey go to work for me and i'll, I'll you know cover for me yeah but not only that you can sometimes keep your id from your employment and i guess you would also check your computer to make sure they were still current even though they had the id exactly which is equally exactly. E equally important exactly but as, mm -hmm. um kuwait is one of the richest countries in the world if not the richest and 
um, deciding country. to take an assignment there, mm-hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, is 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 not like what you see on television. There, it's not a war zone. No, it's it's actually a luxury zone. Hermès, yes. uh, Louis Vuitton, yes, Gucci, Ferrari stores, the finest stores yes. and vehicles in the world. I think the average income. For a Kuwaiti citizen, as I recall, a few years ago, it was like one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Their income is subsidized uh, by their country, mm-hmm. and uh, and they're very. You know how we're having this issue now about mm-hmm. open borders and mm-hmm. so forth. Mm-hmm. There's none of that stuff in Kuwait. You cannot walk into Kuwait. They That's don't. Right. They they're, they're, the only people that they benefit or help are Kuwaiti citizens. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. about anything else. Right. I mean, and it's hard to get in, and they will put you out. And I have an expression: before God gets the news, <laughs> yes. they don't play. They, they do don't, not they don't play. play. You yes. know, they they have structured their society around their people in order to build their people in their community. Mm-hmm. And there, there's time out mm-hmm. for anybody that's not doing that and who's not a part of that. Mm-hmm. So, but you are a part of it because you are on our on our base, correct? Mm-hmm. On the American base, correct? And and based on what I understand, there are numerous checkpoints. Uh, there. Yes. Be- and because you know how you see that stuff on TV yes. with these uh, bombers, I mean people with uh, grenades and mm-hmm. stuff on mm-hmm. them, and you know, a bomb you, you bombs in mm-hmm. there and bombs in their cars. Mm-hmm. They just sort of they can't get through to our embassy or our part of Kuwait, can mm-hmm. they? No. Let, let, Tell let, me what it's like. So so. Tell us our audience so, what it's like. So, this is what you can do after you're retired. And ladies are over there too. Oh, American women a lot and men. of women American are over women there. American women and men. A lot of women are over there. Okay. So, so let let me let. And me, it pays. It, it pays ninety thousand a year, tax free. and it's tax free. Tax free. Tax free. Ninety thousand U.S. dollars that, that, a year, yeah. tax free. Yeah, that that was the perk. You, but but let let me share with you and your listeners and the listeners and viewers, the next time or the last time that you drove out to Metro Airport. And I, I, I've done this, I don't know, a thousand and two times, right? Taking my daughter to the airport today. When you drive down 94, right, from, let's say, Metro Detroit, you hop on 94 and you come up at that Middle Belt exit mm-hmm. or even the Merriman mm-hmm. exit. You hang that left, you whip around, and you pull up into the airport and you drop off your loved ones, your family members right at the, right at the door. Correct. You give them a hug, you, you get off the car, you give them their suitcase, and you say goodbye. Of course, once they go into TSA, that's it. Most countries, hear me out, most countries visualize that trip, 94, coming okay, up at Mirror okay, Melt, okay, okay. Metal Belt. The first checkpoint will be Telegraph Road. There will be a road a checkpoint there. They will, what they call, scrub the car. Right, mm-hmm. walk up under the car with the I've mirror. Seen that. From that point, that only happens when you're coming across the border legally yeah, yeah, in yeah. Mexico. Right, but right. other than that, right, it doesn't right, happen. Right. right, right. Continue, continue to the airport. There will be another checkpoint, maybe at Merriman. By the time you get to the airport to let your loved one or family member out the door, you've already that car has already been checked. That doesn't happen here in America. And not not to say that I'm I'm giving out some information that that could be detrimental. No, it's common information. Do you know if terrorists want to bring down a commercial airline, all they have to do is pull over in their car on Merriman Road and Wick or even Merriman Road and Airport and Drive and use a hand, use a, a, a grenade launcher and they can bring down a plane that's la- either landing or taking off. And the most detrimental uh, airline, it's not Delta, it's not Spirit, and, and I talk I about Spirit. It. Which one do you think the terrorists would would want to American. bring down, and why? Because it says America. It says American, American Airlines. American was easy. Not United, no, not Delta, no, no. Anything but American. Anything that says America. Anything that says America. Because of our actions in the, in the Middle East. That part. But, but once again, to digress, we just drive straight up to the airport and get out and tell our loved ones, have a good trip. But yes, other countries, do. you gotta go through five checkpoints before to get you to the even airport. get to the airport. I see. Yes. And and we have that and, and you were guarding one of those checkpoints for mm-hmm. our embassy. Is that correct? Well not not the embassy, the air for uh the army base. Uh, our army yeah, base, which army is base. equally important. Mm-hmm. How many army army personnel do we have over there? I don't know. 
I mean, I don't know. What, a lot of barracks. Um, a lot of people. Well, a lot of people because you, we have our uh, our allies. They're mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Right. And then of course um, the army, and then of course the contract, the government contract companies. You got Constellus. Uh, you got SS Group. Um, all mean, kinds of contracts. All, ki all kinds yeah, of Defense contracts. Yeah, Defense Department contractors, exactly. right? Exactly. They all have have a land and everything right. there. And then you have the Air Force Base, and there's a there's a separate mm -hmm. uh, entity. Yeah, so and, there are plenty and, of, what I'm saying is there's plenty of jobs over there for people, not just in former law enforcement, but logistics. Um, just like you you need secretaries to, to run anything, there are, there are jobs for that. There are people who are watching other people's children. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 child care. There's a lot of if you just want to experience living in Kuwait. But now, mind you, the, the temperature is one hundred and twenty five surface and one hundred and thirty five air. But it's a dry heat. I always tell people it's a dry heat. Yeah, that's not the same. No. <laughs> it's I'm not out of Vegas when okay. it's like that. I okay. can't take it. I, uh -uh. Well, I, I think no, there's I, a difference. I, can't in, melt. I think um, there's a difference in dry heat than humidity. There is. There okay. is. Okay. You're more okay. miserable with humidity. Yeah. That's but. Point. You are miserable anyway at 125. Well, that's what water is. And, and they actually give us salt tablets. No, that's easy for you because you're bald-headed and everything, you know. It's easy. You can just pour water on your head. Yeah. We, girls aren't going to do that. So but there are women over there, though, now. I there know that there are women there. over and there. And they, they braid their hair, and they and they go and they yeah, go for it. That that That's wonderful. <laughs> but no, uh-uh, not 125 <laughs> degrees. But I guess at 180,000 a year to be a Kuwaiti, and that that be your guaranteed income from the from the government, then that that would help with a lot of air conditioning. And there are Americans that have been over there. Some of, of my course. supervisors have been over there for 12 years. Mm. Uh, Americans uh, have been everywhere in the world. Well, I know that, know. but I'm just saying they we, they decided to leave America and oh, go. And I'm not work. surprised. Yeah. I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. surprised, but they they still need to be careful because that's a whole different. There's no U.S. Constitution over there, and. Uh, so you speaking really of constitution, have to, you really have to, uh, you know, address issues regarding Islamic law. Let Let me share a quick story with you about. And then I got to okay about coming from okay. coming from Honduras, walking through the airport, coming back, the guard, he told me vamos, vamos means let's go. That's okay, right. but because I'm a gentleman, I let a lady go in front of me, and I don't know if he noticed that what I was doing, but he pushed me. Being a former police officer. I don't like to be touched and I wouldn't infringe, take up, you know, someone's personal space. And it, it kind of irritated me, but I immediately thought I'm you in, in another a country, country and if I get locked up, ain't nobody coming to get me until they decide to let them know Correct. that I'm there. So I, I took it. You got it. And I, and I kept walking. It's called eating humble pie. I, I ate it. Yep. I ate it with a glass of, drank it with a glass of milk. Right. But there was steam coming out of your ears. Oh, my goodness. Steam coming out oh of your ears. Oh, my goodness. But I, yes. I understand. Now, when you're in a, a different jurisdiction, yeah. as, as my mother used to say all the time, when you got your head in a lion's <laughs> mouth, you got to pat him on the head and ease it out. Don't let that lion chomp down on your head. Not at all. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to WJZZ Cool TV today. Uh, please, you know, turn on your Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and uh, and 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 follow us today. Our our topic of conversation with former Detroit police officer Paul Johnson is uh, a job opportunities for retired people who still consider themselves grown and sexy. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, he has been since he retired from the police department at forty one, forty two, at forty two. Uh, he's been in Honduras. He uh, lit, teaching English. He did. He doesn't know Spanish. Uh, he's uh, relocated to Vegas, and he also did an assignment in in the country of Kuwait. Um, and that's that was what we were just talking about about their different legal system and so forth. But when you when you work in the Middle East, when you take an assignment in the Middle East, you're paid about two to three times more than what you're paid in the United States, mm -hmm. and your entire income is totally tax exempt. Mm -hmm. So that's the good part. So he make 90,000, that's 90,000 tax exempt, which is the equivalent of about 135,000 uh, if you're staying in the United States. Um, okay, so now you, you're, you're sort of a, if you, I'm calling a, a bi-city person. You're mm -hmm. in Detroit mm -hmm. some of the time because you want to escape the summer heat in Vegas. So you came back here for a real summer. And then you'll <laughs> go back to Vegas, you say, in September, October, when it cools off mm -hmm. there. Because mm -hmm. it's going to be 130, 135 in Vegas this summer. 
Well, I experienced 111 the whole week. And while it was 111, I, did, I, I ran every day because my job requires me to run a mile and a half under 17 minutes. And my time was like 13.5. Uh, and I, I, I did that. But I didn't do it in the, the hottest part no, of the day. No, you don't. You can't. Yeah. So in the morning, the in the we're morning, talking right. in the morning, we're Dawn. talking 7 to 8 o'clock. Dawn. Right. It, it, it's already hot. Right. It's already hot. So, yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. It's, that's, that's but it's great. It's a great workout. It's okay. great conditioning. Well, now that you've had this experience as a police officer mm -hmm. in the city of Detroit mm -hmm. and the experience as an officer, if you will, for our government, not as a not as a military person, but mm -hmm. as an as an officer mm -hmm. uh, in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you are aware of all the things that have been happening in the United States since you've been back about uh, policing and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on 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 the civil liberties issues regarding the police department. I'm a commissioner, okay. so I set the policy for the police department. But um, a number of Detroit's policies have come under fire. Uh, one is no-knock warrants. Detroit allows for no-knock warrants uh, only in certain situations, and it actually requires, for your information, the approval of the chief of police. Mm. It has to be a per like a person has been kidnapped and is in the place, or they're terrorists, mm -hmm. like against the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, there are about four, those sorts of classifications where there are really serious issues. Mm -hmm. Not, you just can't do a no-knock warrant like you did in the Breonna Taylor case. Mm -hmm. You know, just come in because you think some, an American citizen did something. It mm -hmm. has to be, uh, it's almost like a federal issue for you to be able to come into Detroit's homes with a, a no-knock warrant. So that's one issue. Um, so there's you know a lot of, a lot of controversy about that mm -hmm. about whether or not uh, we're going to do you know, whether or not we're going to keep any any no 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 knock warrants. A lot of people want them eliminated. The other problem though uh, of of Mr. Johnson is that when people are serving an ordinary search warrant, you come to my house, you think my brother's there, or you may want to arrest me, mm -hmm. and so you you do this, and so. Um, and but you, I only have thirty seconds to get to the door before you could break down the door. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? I didn't. Yeah, it's thirty seconds. That's a problem, to me. And I've I've raised it with the full de with the department and, and with the commission. So I, I you know uh, we need to address uh, this this policy. Keep going, keep going. Okay. So I mean, but but no knock warrants are legal throughout the United States. The George Floyd Act will make them illegal. At least from a from a federal level. Can can we can we go to a scenario? Yeah, I there, I know, and I've heard many of them. Okay. Where it's important. Okay. Like they like they say in order to deal with people who right. are drug dealers. Right. Device is ready to pair. Right. Uh, drug with with drug dealers and so forth. And my or decision, murder suspects. Let's not just say drug because well, all not, drug not dealers are suspects. To okay. me, not right. a murder suspect. If okay. you committing a murder. Well, okay. Uh, you can. Uh, okay, so the, so we're going we're about to engage now. But, but the okay, but the okay, but the. Uh, but the the drug thing, okay. So you have to wait before you can break in my place, which allows me to flush the drugs. So what? So be it. Okay. The drugs are gone. Okay. But um, and that means you won't get me that time for that. You have to get me okay some other kind some other kind of way. All right. But to be able to you know break down the door, mm -hmm. um, I'm you know it, t it takes me two minutes to get to my door. I even holler out the window, I'm coming. Okay. You know. <laughs> but, okay. So you know, but. The, the police want this, I mean, they're, they they want to keep their 30-second thing to serve an ordinary warrant. Okay. And these limited circumstances for no-knock. Okay. May, so, may, may, so I, may I share? I, that's okay. what you want to say. So, <clears throat> in my early career, um, I, I guess I, I was what they called a, a, a young cowboy. Um, as a rookie cop, I'm going to be honest with you. Being a police officer is full of excitement. Now, every day is not an exciting day. Most days just handling domestic violence, family trouble runs, dealing with people, right? But then there are those days that you get that what they call a hot run. A hot run is a, uh, it could be a hold up alarm at a bank. A hot run could be, um, now mind you, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we, we didn't have the shootings that we have now here in America. So if, if there was a shooting back in early 90s, you know, it, it, it was exciting, let's just say. So it was a big deal. It was a big deal. It was a real big deal. So when people are, and most police officers, if you have family members, 
uh, or current, retired, they know this. When you get that run, it's action. You 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 and your partner, it's you and your partner. So you, you focus you in, you zoom, that siren on, all that, and, and you, you get there. And you going 100 miles an hour. You, and you get there, right? The adrenaline's pumping, and you, you tack, to be tactical, meaning the training that you receive, you have to apply it. Now let's go back to these warrants. It's a life and death situation, and it's a decision call, right? You make the wrong decision, and it can cost you your life. You make the wrong decision, and it can cost someone else's life. Bottom line, you're doing what you're trained, the at best you, knowledge that trained. you have, right? Right. And there's a saying, uh, rule number one in any situation is don't panic. Rule number two is to always repeat or remember rule number one. Because if you panic, things can go awry, okay? So, the upper hand, okay? You and have I, the upper hand. You're well, the police officer. Okay, you've well, got well, on 30 well you, okay, you say that. Okay, you say you've that. Got a, wait a okay. minute. You've got right. on 30 pounds right. of gear. Okay. You've got a gun. Now you've also got a taser. You've got that, but we used to call it billy club, but it's much more dangerous than a billy club now. I mean, you have all kind, and you've got in communication. And in Detroit now, they're even, they even have helicopters for like chase. They don't chase anymore. Incidentally, no. they said you were police officers. No, I, they don't do that anymore. Right, they stopped before I left. Oh, okay. So uh, they, they don't, there are no chases. But, but here's my point. To have the tactical advantage, that's what every military person and every law enforcement person wants to okay, have. Okay, that makes sense. Now, there are some people who, and this is just my take, they've chosen a profession. That profession could be narcotics. That profession can be whatever, right? They have tactical advantage, too. The weaponry that police and, and military have, State they, the ha art. they have them as well. The AR-15 has become the weapon of choice, not just for law enforcement, but for the criminal element as well. Correct. Right? And some of these guys train. My point is this, with the law, knocking versus not, not knock, knocking. I've seen raid teams go into drug houses, Detroit police, as they're ramming the door, That's right. boom. That's right. Right? That's a tactical advantage. You can't say that you didn't say the police. And I'm going to say this. I know everyone's innocent until proven guilty, but the neighbors know where the drug house is because they're the ones who called and had to do the three buys before you can get a legal raid on a property sometimes they get it wrong sometimes they raid the wrong house it happens but 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 the most part is if you're a drug dealer you know eventually there's going to be a knock on your door and you can say well i didn't know it was the police so that's why i shot okay that could be a defense but if you see police officers the raid van pulling up they've got police they've got sheriff on their jackets, on their vests. Brianna you was know. in her okay. bed, and the police broke down the door. I am so and, and came into I'm, her. I'm unit. so sorry that that baby lost her life. And then, but lied we about do it. know, but we do know why the police were there. Correct? Why were they there? Why did the police come there? They were looking for a person that had nothing to do with her, and they knew that she, and they knew well, that person okay. didn't live there anymore. Well, okay. That was. But that was Seven the intel. People. But that was the intel that they had. No, it wasn't the intel. Okay. Before they did the raid, when you look at the even in the grand jury thing, before they did the raid, mm -hmm. they knew that that person had moved to a different spot. Okay. That's where they were supposed okay. to be. They were at A when they should have been at B. Okay. And her boyfriend mm -hmm. had a weapon, mm -hmm. and when the door was knocked down and they came in like that, he thought people were breaking in to hurt them. And he shot a single bullet. Didn't shoot anybody because most people don't shoot straight anyway. But he fired a weapon. He fired a weapon. And, and that, then and, that and calls, then they lit up the whole place. Exactly. And that's what police officers do. You hear one shot go off. Let, okay. So let, let me say this. I just because I can't I speak for every use of force I is a real issue. I can't and speak, restraint. I can't by the speak for every police officer in America, but I can uh, I can share my personal experiences. The summer of 1990. The Burger King on Grand River and Hayden was robbed at 2 in the morning. Long story short, the police officers got there. There were four officers, myself and three other officers. We caught the gunman. He had a sawed-off shotgun. He was running down the alley, and we told him, stop, police. He hit the ground, meaning he fell down. He rolled over 
And I remember seeing him holding a shotgun leveled at us. Not a single officer fired. I was a rookie and I didn't know any better. I thought, well, if no one else is shooting and he hasn't fired a shotgun blast, then we can just successfully arrest him. It takes seconds for him to pull that trigger and he could have killed at least two of us. My point being, every situation is different. And I, I thank God, I thank God that we didn't fire, but as if someone had fired of those four, immediately the other three would have fired because that is That's a correct. that is a reaction that is psychologists correct. have have it, there, there's a term for it that I when you it, hear I, it i call it you guys making people swiss cheese they have okay. so many holes in their body that okay. they're like swiss cheese which is a problem for me okay. and 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 but i'm glad you guys exercise restraint well psychologically and, and you no don't one know, was hurt psychologically you don't know how many shots you fired when when once you engaged well, that that's oh, a psychological that. fact. Oh, I didn't know. No that. one says, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to shoot him three times," or she says, "I'm going to shoot three times." They'll ask you after it's well, over. Well, an automatic weapon is still firing when your fingers on the trigger, right? Well, some some weapons are automatic, but most weapons you have to you have to squeeze the Keep trigger squeezing. to Keep to squeezing. get right, right. That's why they call them <laughs> semi-automatics. Right? Oh. But my point is this: it's a trauma. It's it's you're experiencing trauma. And every police officer, Everybody's male or female, knows that when you go to the gun range twice a year, you're shooting at a what's called a silhouette. It's a paper target. They don't teach you to shoot when the target's shooting back at you. And I've heard bullets whizzing by me, and it, it puts you in a whole different state of mind. But I digress. No, okay. So the issue right now, though, I think for the Detroit Police Department, as well as departments across the, 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 the country, is, is actually training of officers in, in two areas. Mm -hmm. Number one, with respect, quite frankly, I'm calling it racism because um, I have I, I've personally seen this and experienced this and had clients with this problem. If you're young and if you're black and if there are four black guys in a car mm -hmm. on Seven Mile, mm -hmm. they're going to get stopped. Yeah, I I can't I can't even begin to tell you how disturbing this is to me that you just get stopped because you're driving while black. It's so bad, uh, Paul, that a, 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 an officer said this to me and he was joking, and I didn't take it as a joke, and I almost had him disciplined as a result of it. The only place is is safe for four black men to be together or five is a basketball court. He's right. That. That's not that is outrageous, He's and it's right. an, it's it's an outrageous indictment of our police department, particularly in a black city. So, can I share something with you? I don't know, not if it's not if it's on the side of that foolish, racist thinking. In 1980, I was stopped. I was 12 years old, and I was 11, with some other of my friends from church. We were coming from playing basketball, and the Big Four stopped us on Gratiot I know the Big Four off of uh, uh, State Fair. It's just something that 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 is. No, it isn't. It, it isn't. It doesn't happen to white people. It's a. It it, 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 okay. it is racism. Okay. Uh, totally. It is totally racist. There is, the presumption is that because your skin is brown, mm -hmm. that you are a criminal or engaging in a criminal activity, and and from the stop to it, from the tossing of the car to the searching of the people where you see young black people, girls and boys sitting on the side of the of the curb, handcuffed and so forth. It is outrageous. I and, agree. and our department is going is addressing that now. That is definitely officer misconduct. And now with body cams, of course, and dash cams, we can really get the real facts because in the past it was the officer's word against the person. Now um now you have that that body cam on, it's catching everything. And you're and if that's not catching it, of course the uh, camera on the front of your car is. And every officer has on a body cam. And it's a disciplinary uh, matter. If you do not, ha if you say anything, do anything with a citizen and it's not on tape, your body cam has to stay on. Now you can turn it off when the two of you are just kicking it or you want to go to the bathroom or something like that. But the minute that you engage with a citizen, that body cam is on so that people can see uh, what's going on. But it's this thinking that needs to change in the city of Detroit. Um, I, I am so, it, it's just, it, I, I took two guys home 
Uh, I was picking up a client of mine from the detention mm -hmm. center. And there were two young guys getting out about the same time. They were about 18, 19 years, skinny, skinny, you know, pants hanging down to their knees and all that. And so they started walking away from the detention, to detention center across the mound. You know, there's that mm -hmm. grassy thing mm -hmm. in the middle of the street mm -hmm. to the to the uh, towards the gas station where mm -hmm. they could probably. And I asked them, I, I, I picked up my client and I pulled up to them. I said, guys, I said, where are you going? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 and they said, we're going over there to the um, to the gas station. I said, do you have a ride? Mm -hmm. They said, no. I, I said, do you have any money? They said, no. I said, where do you live? They said, Lasher and Seven Mile. Mm -hmm. Now, we're at Mound mm -hmm. and Seven Mile, mm -hmm. I guess, or Six Mile. Mm -hmm. That's like at least six miles away. Or more. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I said, get in the car. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a ride. Mm -hmm. So I took them. And they both of them, had. they didn't know each other, but both of them had the same story. The, the one little one, I said, he was really smart. He seemed, and I said, where'd you go to school? He said he went to Ferndale High or something, mm -hmm. but he had to drop out because he became homeless. Okay. And so then he said, I had to do what I had to do to mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. And and, I, and he was so smart. And I, I noticed, it, and the other guy was in, in school as well. But he said, I said, what happened to you? What are you doing over here? He said, he said, I've been in jail over here three days. I said, three days? Mm -hmm. For what? What happened mm -hmm. to your arraignment? Why weren't you out? Where'd your parents? No parents. Uh, he said that they had, they had, he had, taking a ride from a friend of his, like you. Mm -hmm, Let's say you're riding mm -hmm, down the street, mm -hmm. you see me or a guy that you know. He said, man, you want a ride? You mm -hmm, give him a ride. Mm -hmm. I get in your car. Mm -hmm. He gets in the back, he's a little fella. Mm -hmm. and there's two girls back there, and uh, I mean, uh, two, another guy and one girl and a guy in the front. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're riding down seven mile, the car gets stopped. Mm -hmm. For no reason, mm -hmm. just that these black people are in the car, young black mm -hmm. males. Mm -hmm. They, they make them get out the car, which they have no right to do, as you and I both know. There, there's no probable cause for mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. um, they they search the car. Their uh, the backpack that that the girl had that mm -hmm. doesn't look like a girl backpack. It's a boy backpack. Mm -hmm. Had a gun in it. Mm. So now they search, so now they arresting everybody. He's a person who just got a ride to not drop, not have to walk mm -hmm. an extra four miles, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. knew the guy. And the girl in the car, because she it's her boyfriend's gun. Mm. She's trying to save her boy. She says, mm -hmm. oh, no, it's his. Mm. It's his gun. Mm -hmm. He said, I've never seen this gun before in my life. I didn't even know there was a gun in this car. Mm -hmm. Little, I mean, like five feet two. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, he gets taken to jail for this. Mm -hmm. But but none of this would have occurred but for the illegal stop, mm -hmm. illegal search, mm -hmm. et cetera. So these are a, a police department abuses that I think have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And this perception that because I'm black male, or as the congressman said, uh, Trayvon Martin, because I have on a hoodie, mm -hmm. then I'm a criminal. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's wearing a hoodie now. But Well, at 52, I don't drive with a hood on my head. Well, I do. Well, you're, well and, I'm not, and I'm not being chauvinistic, but women are viewed differently as males. So if you could have on a hood, you could... But what you if, ought to be able to. Okay, but but I can't. Why can't you? Once You're again, bald headed. Your head once, is cold. Once again, being a black male in America, the 52 years that I've been here, I've been I've had guns pulled on me by the police. I, I can go into detail of some incidents that I've had with various police departments, state police, Michigan State Police, uh, um, Ferndale Police, and Hazel Park Police, right? And my daddy used to tell me this when I was a kid. Dead men tell no tales. That's and correct. what he meant by that was, if you encounter a police officer, no matter how hyped he is, you stay calm. Because even if you're right, and you, you don't want, you want your day in court. You want to, if you got to get locked up, get locked up. Make right. your phone call. Let your family know that you're in whatever jail. You're safe. And have them get your attorney, and and then tell your side of the story. But you can't. And, l and let me let me say this: it's not a black or white deal. Most police officers don't like to lose a, a battle on the street. And I was in a situation where a guy I was chasing him, he had assaulted someone, and he stopped and he told me, "I'm not going back to prison." And so I tackled him, and we engaged, and he he got the best hand of me. He he gave me. A, he gave me a good behind with it, but I survived the ordeal. So my point is this. If you're innocent and you know you're innocent, it's not the point. Let I let them let them take you to the precinct and make your phone call. 
Because if you want to stand your ground on the street, most police officers don't want to. Most police officers wouldn't have taken the behind whooping that I took on 4th Street and 12th that summer of, I think that was 1995. They won't. Oh, they because won't. one punch can knock me out. And he said he wasn't going back to prison. The one punch might have been enough for him to keep running or it might have been enough for him to take my gun. Thank God I don't know what that outcome was because I survived it. But my point is this. On the street, it's not, and I, I keep saying this, it's not a black or white issue. It I, is the a media, black and white the, the, issue. Well, the media, okay, but th this is my take. The media loves. The abuse is of black people. Okay. Four white boys can ride okay. from here to yonder. Mm -hmm. You're uh, right. You're and right. not get stopped. And if they do get stopped, they're spoken to courteously. Where are you guys going? What's going on? Have you been mm -hmm. here? There's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Black guys is totally different. And even black women. Of course, now both officers are on both sides of the car. Mm -hmm. In the old days, they just had one officer. Now there are mm -hmm. two officers in every car, as you know. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it just goes on and on. But you have no right to do that, and that's the problem. And that's a training issue. Um, and it, it it's not just limited to black males. It also affects black black females, white women. It, it, officers are so they see five black girls riding like that. You know, same situation. They got to be up to something. They're black. You know, there has to be something wrong. We're going we're gonna to catch them. We're going to get it. Mm -hmm. So these are issues that, you know, impact our community right now. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be affected, of course, by the George Floyd Act. One, of course, is qualified immunity, which we didn't talk about today. Uh, and, and, of course, this whole no-knock warrant thing is being addressed in the George Floyd Act. And a number of other things that will protect the civil rights of, of the community. Uh, while at the same time... Um, allowing officers some discretion, but not discretion to do that, which is what's important. So, um, I, ha I haven't, do you have any, I mean, I'd just like to say to everyone today, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Uh, feel free to call us here at the station anytime. Uh, again, I'm Attorney Linda Bernard. I'm uh, Detroit Police Commissioner for District 2, Northwest Detroit, right over here to my immediate left. And our guest today was Mr. Paul Johnson, a former uh, Detroit police officer who now has had multiple careers since he retired at the age of 41, 42, 42. at the mm -hmm. age of 42, mm -hmm. since he retired. And he encourages you, as I do, as I do as well, to, to one, get on Indeed, or you say get on Craigslist, most of some of his positions he got off Craigslist, and, and, and look at these things and see the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, his most valuable items are his passport and his driver's license. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And I urge you, our entire audience to do the same thing. Let those be your most valuable items, your mm -hmm. passport and your driver's license. And the world is unlimited to you then. Mm -hmm. You can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for Again, having me. it's WJZZ Cool TV, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Follow us. Uh, and share your comments uh, on this broadcast when you have an opportunity. Good day, ladies and gentlemen.